that mistake. Okay. Just preparing to live stream to YouTube now so that the public can see our meeting. Really? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. So um, I would like to introduce um, Kate Maynard from the Capital District Regional Planning Commission and also um, UAlbany and Greg Isaldi, who are going to present this morning on the Gilderland Trails Plan. So um, Kate, if you want to give an introduction and Greg, I'm going to make you the host so you can share your screen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think a lot of you know me in my role at CDRPC. I'm the Planning and Economic Development Director there. Um, and this morning we're talking about um, a job I have in another capacity, which is adjunct faculty with the UAlbany MRP program. Uh, many are familiar with the program or have some connection to it. In this case, we're talking about the Master's in Regional Planning uh, program. In this particular case, we're talking about our studio project that was the spring 2020 uh, semester undertaking. So first of all, thanks, Jen, for the invitation for us to come and speak. Um, Greg and I will, uh, actually primarily Greg, will present on the overall project and what the students were able to accomplish. Um, cue what many know what the setting will be given spring 2020. Not only did we have an ambitious project and work underway, which I will detail now, but we also had a pandemic, which greatly impacted how we were able to complete the work and in what manners we use for communication, et cetera. So just a, a little note about the studio program. Um, the studio is, is really meant to be that transitional uh, project. It's a hands-on opportunity for second year grad students in planning. And I see primarily a number of goals associated with that. First and foremost, for the students, it gives the ability for really uh, the students to apply all that information and philosophy and policy and uh, expertise uh, they learned in kind of a more academic setting, um, apply it to a real life situation and project or issue in a community. So it's very important as planning is such a hands-on uh, role to have this experience and bridge the gap to what will be for professional work in the planning uh, setting and uh, really to connect, to connect with communities. So in our area, I really see the studio offers an opportunity for the program to connect with communities. Um, when we began our work in Gilderland, um, it was great to see the response that we got in terms of the, I'm sure part of it was the pro bono aspect <laughs> in terms of the work and expertise that was able to be applied, um, but really also that community ca connection of students being able to work in the region and connecting back to the value of the program uh, within the capital region. We look for a diversity of projects. So the goal is again, for students to acquire and have their own um, experience uh, through this overall um, setting, but it's also to provide a variety of different diverse projects. So uh, it's all available on the UAlbany website, but um, over the years, we've had a number of different projects we've been able to complete with communities from assisting with uh, comprehensive plans to uh, NRIs, natural resource inventories, in this case, uh, Gilliland's project is a trails focused project. So if any of you in your professional or community action uh, roles uh, think of a potential project of interest, please reach out. You can reach out to me um, as a start. I can connect you with the community advisory board. Um, but really I see it as a great asset the program can offer for again, that pro bono <laughs> expertise uh, within communities for planning needs overall. So a few notes on Gilliland. Um, again, I'll leave primarily the the overall inner workings and how it worked to Greg. Um, but really, uh, as professor, I assisted in setting up the project with the staff um, for the town of Gilderland. So they had reached out and they really saw a need to um, be able to progress their substantial work in both open space planning, parks, and, and trail connectivity. So our project really started with um, the goal to provide for a third party professional standpoint that offered um, conceptually what other connections were available to connect primary destinations within the town, um, really focused on, on parks that really kept coming up um, in our site visit that we held with a supervisor and town staff, as well as the public meeting is there was a real goal to, to better connect for, for all modes, um, these primary parks within the community. 
So we had a great group of students that were um, very charged up and ready to undertake this effort overall. Greg is definitely one of them. Greg uh, assisted greatly with the mapping component um, part of so the GIS portion of the project, um, as well as editing the entire document and just an overall uh, liaison and, and coordinator for, for all the efforts. Um, just a note too on how we kind of set up the effort, how I did, how I led it as professor. Um, we really look to have a um, democratic process, so to speak. So it was important to me that yes, this was a, an academic class. So the students were graded, but to me in especially having gone through the program and understanding how important this experience is to gain that um, professional undertaking, I really let the students have some direction in terms of what they wanted to work on. So I waited to hear what each student was interested in doing. One, for example, wanted to do some visualizations. Another uh, really was interested in the mapping. Another was interested in the community engagement component. So within the, the breadth and the, the depth of the project, there really was a chance for students um, to be able to gain the experience they were looking for and, and be able to kind of uh, branch out and, and be able to gain that experience throughout this. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Greg. Greg Zaldi again is a recent graduate, correct Greg? Yes. Everything's all checked off. Yes. <laughs> Very happy about that. Absolutely. So congratulations to you for that, um, joining the professional planning world. Um, so Greg's going to lead us through, um, he's going to utilize the presentation that the students developed that we'll tell you more about as a recorded presentation um, as part of our pivot we had to do in terms of a pandemic being underway. Um, so Greg, I'll let you go ahead and take it. And um, I assume at the end, we'll have a chance for any questions that people have or, or any other interaction. Take it away, Greg. Thank you. Pull that up right now. All right. Can everyone see uh, the spring 2020 planning studio in town of Gilderland presentation? All right. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and are doing well under you know the current circumstances. My name is Gregory Soldi, and it's my pleasure to introduce the Trails and Open Space Project on behalf of the other eight other studio team members today. Uh, so just an introduction to the town of Gilderland. Uh, we part, uh, partnered with the University at Albany and Master of Regional Planning Program to begin advancements with the Trails and Open Space Project, consisting of developing and redeveloping multi-use trails that would link residential neighborhoods, which included the overall assessment of parks, open spaces, residential developments, and any other existing conditions, identifying po uh, potential local and regional connections that already exist was essential towards providing proposed new connections. This planning process required several key assessments. The review of prior planning studies uh, provided a holistic approach to the project engagement, uh, but it's mostly, uh, at least a lot of the students felt that it was really important to visit some of the historical sites as well. Uh, it's one thing that we can't forget is Gilderland has a very rich historical presence, uh, especially in the capital region. Uh, so we'll see a couple of those places in, later in the slides. Uh, community engagement was a huge piece as well. That strategy helped the students and planners analyze vital community information that may have been included in the research. You know, some at that um, at the meeting, there was a lot of people there. There was people with different ideas. Some had to do with the project, some did not, but they all had a general theme of, you know, hey, I want this in my parks or I want this in my trails. You know, all that information is critical because who are we really designing these trails for? We're designing it for the people of the community. So just a quick community profile. Uh, Gilderland was founded in 1803, population currently of about 35,000. Uh, 2050 population projection of 38,000, so a little bit of growth, nothing too extreme, but it's still decent growth. Um, most age there is about 41 and a half years. The median household income is around 90 grand, and the average commute to work is between 15 and 20 minutes, since it's not too far out of Albany. You know, there's a lot on Wolf Road and Colony. It's not far from there. So in order to better understand Gilderland's Gilder progression over the years, the studio class reviewed previous planning efforts and studies dating back to 1987 to identify past practices and preferences. Previous planning efforts act as a guideline for planning studio scope of work. The town of Gilderland has been proactive in planning efforts over the years. Uh, this was particularly helpful when considering the existing conditions analysis. These conditions uh, was utilized as a starting point to examine the natural and built environment of design sites that were identified as areas uh, 
as areas of immediate interest by town members. Prior to specific site recommendations, it was crucial for students to decipher between complete and incomplete recommendations from past plans in order to analyze whether those recommendations are still applicable. Therefore, recommendations proposed by the studio are built upon the foundation of past efforts while propelling the town's long-term objectives forward. Uh, so the community engagement, we had the public meeting on March 2nd, 2020. Uh, and I'd like to just start out by saying I've been to many public meetings, many town hall meetings and planning board meetings. And normally there was about, you know, five or six people. Uh, there was about like 45 to 50 people at this meeting. So all the students who were very nervous about their first public meeting were definitely shocked to see that there was such a large turnout. But at the same time, it was great that there was such a large turnout. It showed that people really care uh, about their community and, you know, they want to see what they want to see. Uh, so this public meeting was again in March. Uh, it was a hands-on activities for residents to participate in, providing interactive maps uh, and anom anonymous comment cards to create a space for community members to leave honest comments and concerns. Studio members developed four hands-on activities to obtain community feedback, uh, a pathways committee plan recommendation map and concerns, existing conditions town of Gilderland map, an amenities checklist, and public comment cards. So based on the comments from the community, the following recommendations were the most favorable uh, was multi-use trails along Fuller Station Railbed, off-road multi-use paths between Route 155 and Knot Road to connect the Knot Road Park and neighborhoods east of Route 155, and the Albany Loop, a trail along Route 155 past Farmsworth Middle School. So here's our identified key destinations map. Uh, it's a little blurry, but you can't really see, uh, but I can quickly detail. So the numbers here, uh, one through 13 at the bottom, those are all the different parks and important sites. So Water Relief Reservoir was one, uh, Tawasenta Park was a major one, uh, Albany, um, the golf course was a major park. Um, so this map portion shows the key destinations for connectivity. Community members and stakeholders were encouraged to indicate on the map where they believe potential pathways would be useful in connecting parks to other parks or existing trails to parks and even where bike lanes could be implemented. So now we will get into the recommendations uh, for most of the actual parks themselves. We were able to split up the parks. So between the uh, nine total students, there was about 13 different destinations. We were able to split those up and figure out, okay, here's the existing conditions. Here, uh, you know, are there any, were there any proposed projects from what we did our research on? And how can we incorporate these, you know, make more of a holistic view to the park and trail system in Gilderland? So this is just an overview of all of Gilderland. So the pink and black dots going along from like the village of Altamont to Voorheesville and all over. Those are proposed multi-use plans or what we recommended. And what's currently is the, it's kind of hard to see, but right in the middle, you can kind of get a good idea is uh, the existing trails where it's just like a solid red line. So those are existing and the purple, uh, the multi-use recommended. So here's the Winter Rec and Western Turnpike Golf Course. Uh, main connection exists between Tawasenta Park and the rec area. The proposed connection to the golf course through the outdoor uh, theater of Tawasenta Park and the north side of the park. The existing trails will connect Foundry Road, Knot Road, uh, and Winding Brook Lane. Historical uh, sites will also be added to the trail system, and Route 146 could be altered to accommodate pedestrian traffic. Uh, so here's for DiCaprio Park. Oh, they're there. Uh, so the connections currently exist between the Albany Pine Bush and Volunteer Firefighters Memorial Park. The potential trail exists to the south of the park via the Hunger Kill River. So you can see that going all around. And here's Water Relief Reservoir just in the bottom left corner. Uh, protected land to the south of the Pine Bush has opportunities for trail implementation to connect Gilderland Elementary School. There's definitely a lot of concerns, or not really concerns, but comments about connecting the schools to different parks or because there's a lot of residential developments around these parks or, you know, off the road of some of these parks. And with those residential developments, you know, parents want their kids to be able to get to school and they want it to be safe. That's, you know, the biggest concern is always going to be safety. 
So safe walk paths or safe trails, you know, that are well lit or, you know, are at least somewhat flat or paved or, you know, well groomed were definitely a major concern and, and definitely a good point for, you know, some of these children trying to go to the school or the library. So here's for not road park. Uh, central location and the nearby town owned parcels make this area a valuable intersection, developing a multi use loop trail surrounding the park and utilizing the right of way could also connect with the CDTC for proposed regional trail. So for Roger Keenholz Park, uh, we would want to utilize the closed bridges to create a trail from French Hollows Falls. Uh, using the open space near the landfill site to develop an interpretive educational trail and connecting Keenholz Park to Tawasentha Park, as well as Gilderland High School. So again, you know, coming up again with a school is a big part. So here's, we have Fred Abel McNoanville Park. And I believe this is the park that's right off of Stuyvesant Plaza. Um, most people don't really know it's a park. It's kind of just that grass patch, but it is actually a park. Uh, so we would want to here construct multi-use paths on Strawberry Lane, Schoolhouse Road, Fuller Road, McCone Road, Norwood Street, uh, maintaining and extending power line path and bike and pedestrian connection between Stuyvesant Plaza and Crossgates Mall, enhancing park visibility via signage and beautification. So again, most people don't know it's a park. So, you know, why don't we tell people it's a park? Put a, you know, we could put anything there just to let people know. And, you know, maybe we might get a bench there. Or we might get a couple trails, people walking on it. And now there's a safer way for people to walk across Western Ave because currently there's, I don't believe there's really a sidewalk there. It doesn't really seem like a safe area to walk on. So here we have the Black Creek Marsh Wildlife Management Area. So a couple recommendations for this one. The site's main entrance on School Road is only in very close proximity to Voorheesville Public Library, Main Street in Voorheesville. The Albany County Rail Trail Pavilion and the Voorheesville Elementary School. Although these destinations are not located within Gilderland's town limits, they're not uh, they are the only destination points in the area surrounding the Black Creek Marsh. Uh, therefore, the location may be a strategic site for integrated regional planning and connectivity. The CDTC uh, plan recommends that the existing Albany County Heldeberg Hudson Rail Trail could be extended to follow the rail line as a multi-use path from the Rail Trail Pavilion on Grove Street in the village of Voorheesville to the village of Altamont. This proposed rail trail extension will bank the rail uh, that bisects the Black Creek Marsh Wildlife Area. Traveling three miles north from, I'm sorry, someone have something to say? Oh, no, okay. Um, traveling three miles north from the Black Creek Marsh on Depot Road provides direct access to Gilderland Center. The signage would be offering cyclists more visibility and safety by installing road traffic signs to protect vulnerable road users. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, could be an immediate first step enhancing the connectivity between Gilderland and Black Creek Marsh. So for here's for Bozenkill Preserve. While the town of Gilderland does not own or operate the site, it's possible that an initiative to enhance and rebrand wayfinding in and around town owned sites could include participation by willing third party sites and organizations. Townwide coordination of wayfinding improvements may be desirable to private and public pri uh, and to public site owners and operators and make connections among all sites in the town of Gilderland more visible and intuitive for the public. Additionally, there is no signage to designate the preserve on Westville Road. At a nondescript entrance point, the town can install uh, some signage indicating the location of Bozenkill Preserve. Uh, second. So here's Water Valley Reservoir. Developing any trails along the Water Valley Reservoir requires coordinators between the city of Water Valley and the town of Gilderland. Proposed trail could include extending the Vosburg trails around the reservoir to any potential recreation that is agreed upon. Now we visited all of the sites here today. We went as a large group with the town of Gilderland and then everyone went individually and viewed their own parks that we had separated. And I would say Water Valley Reservoir was definitely my favorite. It was beautiful there. However, it was freezing. I did not bring a coat. I did not know we were going all the way around and I did not remember that it was the winter, but it was still great there. Uh, so here's Tawasentha Park. Uh, Tawasentha Park is already well integrated. Um, it has a bus stop right outside. 
It has uh, beautiful walking paths. There's trails that connect it between Tausenta Park and across the street and the hiking trail across the street. So one is really just creating a pathway connecting the golf course to Tausenta Park since they're pretty close to each other. Uh, it would make sense to, you know, have people walking in safe areas around the golf course uh, just to extend the trail. So here we have uh, Albany Pine Bush Preserve. So we'd like to establish a multi-use trail along the power line to connect Pine Bush Preserve Yellow Trail to the concept route of 155, a walking trail proposed as part of Winding Brook Commons project as well as a multi-use trail alongside West Boundary of Gilderland Elementary School. So here are those historical sites. Uh, so this offers a look into the historical background of the town of Gilderland, as well as a potential uh, sites for trail connectivity. After discussions with town officials, it was concluded that the involvement of historical sites with trail implementation would be useful. The town of Gilderland has a strong rural and industrial past that can be conveyed to the residents and visitors using the trail system. Not only will trails be able to amplify the importance of these sites, but it can add an educational component and a sense of identity for the town. With the rich historical context in the town process, it is only natural for many historical sites to exist within its boundaries. Some sites include the Battle of Normanskill, which took place during the Revolutionary War, the Vale of Tawasenta, an old Native American burial ground, the farm of Everett Banker, who was the third mayor of Albany, as well as the Albany Glassworks site, which is considered to be one of the first glassworks sites in the United States. This site offers uh, to be an amazing way to improve Gilderland's trail system, which also brings the town's historical past and significance to light. Inclusion of historic sites through trails will also attract new hikers, promote education, and will continue uh, to connect the community with its rich heritage. So going back to the trail amenities and marketing for uh, the town and their trails, we this is the um, the amenities list that I uh, mentioned before, where people would vote on what they would want to see, or what was a, a hot topic that came with you know the desires for these trails during the planning process. So using these public comments, uh, several recommendations can be made. There's almost equal interest in developing trails for hiking and biking. So a paved multi-use path would most likely be the most cost-effective implementation. That way, you know, you could, we don't need two separate trails or we don't need, uh, you know, a, or a more, um, you know, a less paved trail and one for just biking. If it was just one larger trail that we can include, you know, a bike lane and a walking lane, it would accomplish the same goal. Uh, so since loop trails were uh, preferred over out and back trails, when appropriate, loop options could be prioritized. The community also identified seating areas, restrooms, trash receptacles as being the most important amenities. Finally, it is recommended that the town increase and develop their wayfinding and branding for their parks and trails. Wayfinding is the system and provides guidance, typically using signage to ensure that trail users are comfortable knowing where to go. The six types of signs would be for uh, decision signs could be placed in locations where users have multiple trail options and need to decide which trail to take. Affirmation signs reassure the user that they are on the correct path. These should be placed in locations where they, there may be a brief interruption of the trail, like an intersecting road. Uh, map kiosks are regional maps that show how multiple trails interconnect with one another. Map panels should depict specific trails and their amenities. These should be placed at the beginning of the trail. Way markers are small circular signs typically nailed to trees that provide continuous affirmation that the user is on the intended path. It is recommended that the town develop and implement a consistent uh, sign design theme using these categories to create a sense of continuity between all our parks and trails. You know, when you're on a Gilderland trail, you want to know that you're on that trail. If, if the signage changes or if, you know, the color theme changes, you're not going to be sure that you're on the same trail or are you even in the same town? You might not, you know, if you don't have a GPS on your phone or if your phone's dead, how are you going to know you're on the right trail or you're heading back to Gilded Land where you started from? So using the receptive or the repetitive slogans, logos and wayfinding, uh, we created an identity that could be associated with the, the town's trails and parks. This town has previously began building their branding using 
the hike Gilderland, so that phrase could be continued to maintain consistency. It's recommended that the town develop a recognizable logo that can be quickly associated with its trail systems using symbols commonly associated with the outdoors like trees, mountains, and the sun. Using a capital G to represent Gilderland, these four examples were created. And I think that they ended up liking the one on the left with the sun the most. I think they ended up going with that if they're going to change anything. So, you know, everything always comes down to money. How, how can this be afforded? You know, is it going to cost taxpayers anything was definitely a major question. So securing funding is crucial to the implementation of this project. A section explores various methods of funding for Gilderland's trail development. Funding could be accessed uh, through multiple allocations. Uh, this could be done via a dedicated tax stream, direct budget allocation, or dedicated portions of existing revenue or fees towards trail development. This method may involve community outreach to gather interest from residents on how effective this method could be. Various state and federal grants are also outlined in this section as, they grant, as these grants are statewide. Gilderland could be competing with other municipalities. All the grants listed in this section fund trail development in some way. Whether it be implementation planning or building the trail itself, Gilderland is eligible for all grants listed in the report. Uh, and mention is uh, about a 200 page document going into all the details and everything you could possibly imagine about every park. Uh, so that's that document I'm referring to. Uh, New York Streamline Consolidated Funding application can be submitted for multiple grants, allowing Gilderland to not have to do, do any duplicative work in applying for funding. Uh, so lastly, just wanted to go over the working from home during COVID. Uh, so we've, when we first heard of the dangers associated with COVID-19 on that Wednesday of the last class we had in person, I don't think anyone really thought that classes would be suspended until the end of the semester. However, we figured that we should have a contingency plan just in case everything was canceled. You know, what are we going to do? How do we get this project done? Because personally, I wanted to get my master's degree and I wanted to, I wanted to be done. And I know a lot of my former uh, students wanted that as well. Uh, so instead of our regularly scheduled classes, we had weekly meetings with the whole class on Zoom and then smaller meetings as we would break out into teams or if you wanted to just go over something with someone, we would just have individual meetings. Uh, the only way that this project could be completed was if everyone was committed to the same goals and put the time and work that needed to be. I'm very glad to say that we did finish our goals on time despite not being able to meet in person or have the public engagement uh, that we were supposed to like we did in the beginning of March. And uh, I would just like to thank everyone for having Kate and I here today. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks, Greg. Um, uh, we had a question in the chat. Okay. And it um, asked if the group did any um, assessment of the potential environmental impacts and also of the potential to reduce vehicle miles traveled from creating a trail network? Uh, yeah, so for the vehicle miles traveled, we didn't do any direct studies on that. However, uh, a lot of the multi-use paths and most, honestly, most of the trail uh, trails we recommended had more than just, uh, you know, hiking destinations. It was really a lot of connecting, let's say, like Tawasenta Park and or, um, you know, Freda Bell Park to schools or, you know, restaurants, uh, bus stops, uh, really trying to get a more uh, fluid connectivity between the town and environmental impact statements. Uh, we did, I don't believe anyone really worked on that. I think that was delegated more to the town. Yeah, if I could add to that, um, two things. One is at the uh, initial stages of the project, um, at least one or two of the students actually completed more of an overview, community, demographic, economic profile of the community. So one of the things that really came out pretty strongly was the high commuter rate, um, the slight working from home increase, which of course became much more interesting as the pandemic hit and we all experienced um, many experience a change to in that manner um, to that aspect of working from home. And then also looking at um, the opportunities for connecting residential commercial areas, which, you know, Tom, to your point, are potential areas to reduce that vehicle mile traveled uh, rate within the community as a whole. 
So we saw a lot of opportunity. Um, the layout of Gilderland is uh, fairly suburban in, in concept. It is a primarily a driver uh, aspect in terms of transportation, but the town is, is very um, diligent in working hard to create uh, in, their, in their mind, our site visit, they talked about the increase in density through some of the recent projects coming through and their goals to create other modes of transportation. So I think what we collectively thought as a group was, you know, focusing on, on the opportunities to reduce those trips or, or shift them from what might be uh, car trips to walking or biking trips. And a lot of times it was biking just due to the distances involved with some of the actual destinations. And then environmentally, we did not delve into that as a conceptual plan. So all those items would, would basically be the town's um, bailiwick to, to move forward and progress. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to talk. Thanks. <laughs> Um, John Mitchell asks if we're aware of the HMPE, but I'm not sure what he, what the HMPE is. John, if you want to. The Hudson Mohawk Power Express, which is going to be following the train, train lines down uh, to Selkirk from Schenectady, you know, pretty much goes through that area and would be a, a suitable platform for uh, putting trails in parallel to the train lines. Is it a former rail line? Uh, it, it's it's going on on current, uh, you know, existing rail lines. Active rail line. It's active rail line, so it's it's rail with trail. Um, and in Hudson Mohawk Power Express is not yet. Oh, I'm sorry, not Hudson Mohawk. Yeah, that, yeah, Hudson Mohawk, Champlain, Champlain Power. Ah, man, I'm getting the names all wrong now. Champlain Hudson Power Express. Oh, let me look it up here. But anyway, there's a, there's a, a, a thousand megawatt power line planned to come from Montreal down to New York City that is traveling down through the Champlain, uh, Lake Champlain and uh, following rail lines basically down through Schenectady, down to uh, Selkirk and back into the river down to New York City. Uh, I was not familiar with that. I, I didn't even know that was happening. I had no idea. Champlain yeah. Hudson Power Express, CHPEs. And it's it's been, uh, it's been approved and it hasn't been built because of economics of natural gas uh, power generation being, you know, cheap. Okay. Thanks, John, for the comment. Um, we're at the point, too. We've had some um, additional inquiries. I've spoken to a few interested uh, residents or just uh, actually one from the capital region who've done a lot in the town of Bethlehem in terms of parks and trails. So we'll pass that on to the town. We had asked uh, the town planner, Ken Kowalczyk, um, to attend if he could today. He was unable. So we're happy to pass that on as kind of a supplement to the students' work here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Champlain Hudson Power Express. Got it, thanks. Any other questions? All right, I will pass this back to you, Jen. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, Kate. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Sure. All right. Um, so I will share my screen and we can jump back into the rest of the agenda. Um, so um, we just have a couple of updates from CDTC and other things that are going on in the region. Um, of course, our COVID-19 updates, we, the governor has extended um, the virtual meetings and CDTC is going to, we don't have a date anymore, but we're just going to say for the, you know, for the foreseeable future, all um, public and in-person meetings are canceled and we're trying to do as much virtual as we can. We are 
integrating as many of our virtual meetings that would typically be open to the public to our YouTube and trying to continue to do public outreach and um, involvement. So staff is in the, each staff person is in the office two days a week. The office is open Monday through Thursday, but we are asking um, folks to kind of hold off on visiting or stopping by for now. Um, and we'll continue to provide updates on that. We have a resources, a COVID-19 resources page on our website. If you'd like to um, see more information, you can go there. Also, uh, we are working with CDRPC um, to develop an Open Streets webinar, and we'll uh, share that date and information with you when we um, nail that down. Actually, Jen, we can share that. I just had confirmation from our speakers. Okay. Um, so let me just pull it up. Excuse me. Uh, August 27th at 10 a.m., and that's a Thursday. Great. Thank you, Kate. So we'll provide that information in the notes, but if you want to mark your calendars for August 27th, that's when the Open Streets webinar will be, and it'll go through some local examples of how different communities have um, adapted the street space to accommodate other uses, like restaurants to aid in recovery efforts. Um, and we will cover all different kinds of streets from local, uh, city streets to state streets. There is a DOT special use permit right now for um, special use for temporary uh, allocation of street space. So we'll be discussing that, but you can also go to the DOT website to find that. Um, and on our resource page, we link to a transit toolbox, uh, the NACDO and Bloomberg cities tools for rapid response and other information. So just uh, looking at the most recent VMT data that we have been able to get from Streetlight um, is traffic has somewhat rebounded, but not completely recovered. It's still well um, below baseline. So, um, you know, we haven't seen a full back to work uh, and commute for everyone quite yet, but we are watching this as we can get this data um, and we'll keep everyone updated and it will be interesting to see if this kind of changes on a uh, more long term basis. Um, oh, thanks, Tina. Tina put a link in the in the chat uh, regarding the Champlain Hudson Express um, and Kate put the information about the webinar on August 27th. Okay, thanks guys. So if anyone has uh, photos of recent activities in the region related to COVID recovery, social distancing and reuse of transportation infrastructure, please feel free to share them. We're, we're interested in compiling um, kind of an inventory and trying to see what's going on. And um, if anyone has questions or would like assistance, please reach out. Um, other uh, ongoing programs, the CDTC, CDRPC Technical Assistance Program is open and we are accepting um, proposals and applications. Um, the deadline was extended, so all the information is on our website. As you know, we did solicit for trails plan um, implementation of trails feasibility studies related to implementation of the Capital District Trails Plan. CDTC has $75,000 in federal funds available to assist in a study. We received five proposals uh, requesting over $300,000. So we have assembled an evaluation committee and we will be reviewing these proposals and um, choosing, uh, prioritizing them for funding. So. Um, we'll keep you updated as that moves forward, but we should um, have uh, a study picked out probably by October. Again, the Complete Streets Workshop has shifted to rolling acceptance. So if you are interested, please go to our website. There's information there and submit your um, application. I believe we have funding available for one more. 
And the same for the ADA transition plans, we've moved that to rolling acceptance. Again, information is on our website and it will be in the uh, meeting notes. So as we know, New Vision's public outreach has shifted to kind of an ongoing um, thing through September when we expect our policy board to adopt the final plan. We canceled all of our in-person meetings and events and we've switched to almost all virtual. We have developed some flyers and stuff to get out through the libraries, the food banks and other nonprofits who are doing and the bike rescues who are doing in-person um, contact with people to get the word out. But we've mostly done things online through webinars and other online platforms. And even beyond September, we'll continue to do um, provide opportunities for people to engage and provide feedback because with COVID, we have identified things that should be uh, adjusted or updated and we'll continue to do that. So um, again, you know, most of it has been online. We've done some social media campaigns. We set up a virtual voice mailbox that can receive text messages. And we completed our vo virtual public workshop series that we uh, had throughout the month of July. And this is just uh, some snapshots of how, um, of things we've developed to engage the public. So in the virtual public workshop series, we did live polling and asked uh, people who are participating questions like what they liked about living in the capital region or what a quality region means to them. And they were able to provide feedback. Um, there was a real, uh, definitely a range of feedback for it, but for the most part, you know, walkability and access um, were all really high uh, priorities for people and things that really stood out as something that they wanted to see continue to be developed and nurtured in the region. Uh, generally, there was overwhelming uh, support for all of the policies recommended in New Visions. Um, the only, you know, uh, policy that had any kind of disagreement or had a more nuanced discussion was around how to manage congestion. Um, and then for the scenarios, uh, there was most support for the concentrated development or the concentrated development with incentives. So it was really interesting to see how people reacted to these different ideas and their support for them. Um, and then we looked at the funding poll that's been online on our website that we custom built for New Visions to see how people uh, prioritized funding, um, transit, maintenance, and bike ped improvements were all in the top three. But there was also, you know, good support for a range of the different programs and projects that CDTC supports, um, and it was good to see repairs or maintenance as high as it is because maintaining the existing system is the highest priority of New Visions and the region. So um, there is a report that summarizes all of the feedback we received and it's on the New Visions webpage. I will send it out with our, project, with our meeting notes, um, but we did not get a ton of written comments, but it was good to see that people were reviewing the report uh, and participating and giving some feedback. So what's next for New Visions? Um, it is scheduled to be approved by Policy Board in September, along with our Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan. Uh, we see New Visions as a living document and something that we will continue to update and adjust. Um, due to COVID, there are things that have been updated and maybe even reimagined um, going forward. So we'll be working on all of those things. Also, any um, large regional planning initiatives, like for example, the Capital District Trails Plan become part of New Visions and um, will be adopted as part of New Visions. Can everyone still hear me or see me? Yes, okay. I just got a message that my internet was unstable. So just wanted to check. Um, 
And we'll continue to do workshops and virtual uh, meetings and webinars regarding different New Visions topics and themes. So kind of being able to dig deeper on a specific topic like transit or like bicycle and pedestrian or environmental um, environment and technology. Those are things that we would like to do going forward. So we'll do those even beyond uh, September. And, see, and New Visions is implemented through our UPWP and through the TIP. We evaluate all CDTC funded and supported projects uh, based on the criteria that is laid out in New Visions. So those New Visions uh, investment principles and the other themes in there are all influence how we evaluate and prioritize projects that we support. Um, and then we are required to do updates every, uh, a minor update every five years, a major update every 10. We've been doing some more significant updates every five years just because technology and other things have been evolving and changing so fast that we would like to stay current and keep up. Um, so we plan on doing another update in 2025. Okay. Um, everyone can still hear me and see me. Yes. Okay. It's not letting me, um, move my slides forward because I have lost connection to my VPN. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, other updates we had, I know Lindsay Garney is on. I don't know if uh, Lindsay, you have any updates related to CDPHP cycle that you want to provide? If Lindsay's still on. We might have lost Lindsay, but um, you may have seen that the CDPHP cycle bikes have are out around the region and um, CDTA has been working with CDPHP um, cycle to expand that. Uh, they recently painted one gold and a bus gold for their anniversary. So um, be on the lookout for those. And I cannot connect back to my VPN. Great. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, if there are any other updates that anyone would like to share, either by typing into the chat box or unmuting and talking, um, be happy to hear from you right now. I just wanted to attest to a CDPHP cycle. Um, as far as I can tell, they are doing very frequent pickups, restaging of the bikes, sanitizing them. There's hand sanitizer included with every single one. Uh, and they're trying to make sure they're uh, around the regional trails in particular to, uh, to make sure that people are able to ride socially distanced. So yeah, it's a great resource right now. Yeah, thanks Jordan. Um, I, this is Tina. Is there um, any way that we could ask them for some of the data about usage? Um, I've seen them out and about in Saratoga, but I'm just wondering what the usage difference is between this year and last year. Yeah, I can um, reach out to Lindsay and see if she can present that at the next meeting. Yeah, it would have to be, of course, to percentage of bikes because they've been doing the rolling rollout. But. Yeah. Okay. I see Tina also commented in the chat box that um, Burlington's doing great things with closing streets for social distancing. So if you um, are interested, you can check that out. Yeah, I, I can send, I have some pictures on my phone. Um, okay. I can try to send them, but it was really, it was really nice to see the neighborhoods getting blocked off and it was for local traffic only. Mm -hmm. And it was okay. for social distancing, especially around the college. Great. Um, and John commented, and I was going to provide an update that the Zim Smith Trail uh, extension from Half Moon to Mechanicville is complete. And John says it's great. So um, if you get a chance to get out and visit it, uh, we encourage that. We are, Jordan is doing counts this week um, so that we can get some baseline information for that section. I can say that I, I, I just finished the counts yesterday. It seemed that people who knew the extension was there 
were using it and very excitedly using it. Uh, and people who didn't know it was there uh, continued using the existing segment that, uh, that they know exists. <laughs> Yeah, and I think since our last meeting, um, I mean, several other trail projects are have been completed or are moving forward. The South End uh, Bikeway link between the Albany County Rail Trail and the, rip, the riverfront, um, the first phase of that has been completed. That is a great separated cycle trap type of facility right there in this, um, uh, that starts at the trailhead in Albany for the county rail trail. And then also the Water Elite cycle track on Broadway has construction of that has started. So you'll see that um, paving has been done and it's moving along pretty quickly as well as the Manans connection to the Mohawk Hudson Trail. If you use the Mohawk Hudson Trail, you'll see a ton of construction in the Manans area and kind of the switchbacks that they've um, that they've constructed you and then connected to the uh, 787 ramp. So um, that's moving forward pretty quickly. So if there are any other project updates or trails that have, are moving forward, have construction has completed or is about to start, definitely let us know so we can keep everyone updated. Okay, are there any other updates? Um, Teresa has noted that the Clifton Park, um, the, their bike ped committee has submitted their reopening transportation plan to Shen, and they're recommending to include cycling and walking as options for traveling to school. Teresa, that's really good to hear. That's something that has been coming up as schools are reopening and transportation is an issue and they're going to be limiting uh, school school bus transportation or they're encouraging parents to bring their children to school. Um, congestion and drop off, I think around schools is gonna be a problem. So it is good to hear that the group has, uh, is encouraging the school to look at biking and walking. Um, even, you know, setting up drop off points nearby school and then creating a path so students can safely walk or bike, I think will be, a good idea and it'll be interesting to see how schools handle this. CDTC is going to put together some resources um, to, for schools so they can, if they're interested, engage and we'd be happy to help or answer any questions. That's good to hear. Thanks, Teresa. Is there anything else? Okay, um, I am sorry about the technical difficulties on my end. Um, I think we did cover all the agenda items. So our next meeting is scheduled right now for September 8th. So I will be in touch with details and a Zoom link to register. Um, and if you have any questions or comments or anything you need to get in touch, uh, please feel free to email me. You can call the office. Um, I will eventually get your voicemail, but if you email me, I can respond uh, within that day, probably. So, all right, everyone, stay safe, and uh, we will see you next month. Thank you.